I could just go back to both in the sense of on Jerry's question. In your, one of your first slides that you had had, had your, you used the example of uh, in terms of domestic politics in terms of uh, the British bailout now of the bank. Yeah. And you had the slide that shows $10 billion worth for foreign aid. Uh, and <coughs> in terms of incentivizing, but now all of a sudden Britain's going to come up with $50 billion to bail out a bank. Yeah. Money they don't supposedly have in their budget. Yeah. So in, the, in that context, the part that's not in the, is, is the assumptions about what can be done in yeah. terms of what are the conditions under which all of a sudden a problem gets elevated to, so, to, to one that, yeah, yeah. oh, we do have money for that. Right. There are lots of things we have money for. And, and so some of the drivers on domestic uh, concerns right. are, in fact, international. So for example, on AIDS, if, it was, if, if somebody were to find out that it was, um, in fact, an extraordinarily infectious disease airborne, yeah. There'd probably much more, be much more interest in ramping up the amount of money we spent on antivirals to protect us right. from, and all of a sudden we'd have the money for that. Right. So, Michael, you know what we say in economics is that uh, these could be superior goods, like war, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, where I simplify, Jerry, perhaps, uh, and this relates to you, the, where I simplify the model uh, in the first round of analysis is there's no budget deficit, right? T equals P. So I don't have a budget deficit. If I put into place a budget deficit, sure, I can play around more. Then you get into interesting problems of intergenerational justice. You know, Then you have to think of these problems in terms of intergenerational justice, which are, are tough problems to deal with. There, I think, is where you want to do the complication, because that's really what a budget deficit is. Uh, you'll recall, uh, for example, that Adam Smith says, if you want to go to war, raise taxes immediately. That's the only proof. You want to fight AIDS, raise taxes uh, to do it. Okay, so it would come out of someone's hide. Uh, but one could complicate the model and think of intergenerational problems, in a sense, and how those would play out. And I think that's a very, you know, very useful comment, which I'm actually going to write down uh, <laughs> to think about how I would model because these are really these intergenerational problems that are very. Strictly speaking, you don't need a budget budget balance. You just need to have a starting point for the budget. Yeah. And And I always say, Michael, one of my greatest puzzles is why do we hate our children? You know, it's really one of my puzzles. We leave them with wars, with conflict, with deficits. You know, we treat, you know, there is a reason why children hate their parents, right? I mean, we do leave them with a lot of really bad stuff. And it's one of the biggest puzzles in moral philosophy. It's one of the biggest puzzles in moral philosophy. You know, these problems of why we treat the next generation badly. We're so selfish. You know, and you see that. It's an interesting, these intertemporal problems are very interesting. Um, if you actually have economists think in terms of present value. <laughs> well, I, well, you know, I think economists have thought about, what, you know, they've thought a lot about these intergenerational problems because they want the optimal savings. That's what I don't think. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, Steve? Uh, are we about to close? No? Well, let me, let me try a quick one. Yeah. Um, I, at, at the risk of trying to impose a narrative that you haven't given us. I, I was provoked by Giles's question to, to rethink this. You set this up as a, as a story of the Cosmopolitans coming in and framing this problem in a way that doesn't deal with real world constraints. And you've had a couple of different categories of constraints. One of them is people won't pay more than 10% for these products. Another is domestic governments are complicated, and we've gotten onto the domestic government theme here. But you ended by talking about how important it would be to connect with local NGOs. And that led me to think about ways in which the cosmopolitans are subversive. Mm -hmm. They're subversive in that they abstract from contemporary beliefs and impose new universally moral beliefs. And they also abstract from practicalities like the way governments are structured. And what they're trying to do is to get away from the fact that sometimes governments and institutions and even contemporary ideas are flawed and corrupt in some way. Yeah. Well, the idea of connecting with global civil society suggests that if you could just get to voters, if you could just get to ordinary people, mm -hmm. you'd have a kind of bottom-up view of optimal public goods position that is as independent of governments and institutions as the top-down 
cosmopolitan view. And so your final story, which is connecting global civil society with local civil society, you talk about local NGOs, but it's, it's really make a difference. some civil society organization that's independent of formal governments. It gives the whole, your whole story a kind of, it's not the cosmopolitans and the constraints, it's a top-down subversive view mm -hmm. meets a bottom-up subversive mm -hmm. view. Right. Is that a way of yeah. thinking about what no, the, the theme here? Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. That, well, first, you know, that's why I said um, one of the things that surprises me in a sense that global civil society hasn't invested more, if you will. And what's interesting, you know, when an Oxfam, you know, goes in, like I deal a lot with Oxfam in South Africa, they're an enclave. They've actually abandoned uh, some of their field work to become a direct lobbyist. And I think that's been counterproductive for them, Steve, because they're seen now as Oxfam coming from the UK telling us South Africa what to do. Whereas I think they would be more effective if they did build up, you know, some civil society on the ground. And, you know, I don't quite understand why that hasn't been more central to GCS strategy. In a sense, you know, maybe they haven't kind of thought about uh, that. Um, so I do take your point. Now, at the same time, what I wanted to show by looking at these take-up rates is how, you know, the only thing I've learned in all these years studying globalization, you know, 30, 40 years of studying globalization, whatever, is how sticky domestic societies remain. You know, domestic, so the political economy of domestic societies remain incredibly sticky, domestic institutions. And so, again, you have to, you know, norms don't flow, fr flow free freely. The question is, how do you influence? And I don't have a good answer to that. How do you Although successful? global civil society puts top-down pressure on sticky domestic right. institutions. Right. But if you look at an argument like Sam's about yeah. you know the value of educating women, right, right. that is meant to put bottom-up pressure right. Right. on sticky domestic institutions. Right. And you come back to this global, local kind of right. interplay right. As, a, as a strategy. Yeah, yeah. no, I think that that's right. Uh, that's an excellent point. But as I say, I haven't, when I actually look at global civil society, I haven't seen that as an explicit part of their strategy. It's very much focused on industrial world and, as you said, a top-down part of that equation. And it goes back, in a sense, to James Q. Wilson. Because, again, what are the leaders of global society? Who are they appealing to? Who are their members? You know, when you get into all the politics of global civil society itself. Okay, thank you. This was, for me, very, you know, I apologize in a sense for pro providing work in progress. I know people often like to hear finished going into the publisher, but for me this has been great, very helpful.